let's not shit ourselves and think that we're anything more than what we actually are. We're not important to society. We're not celebrities. But you get that moment of feeling like a rock star yeah. when your shit flies off the shelves. And, and that is just a – it's a good feeling. And it it is – what I would say is it's not anywhere near relaxing. I feel mm. like now we have to live up to the hype. Yes, so it's like every yes. knife has to be better than the last. Otherwise, people will be like, oh, he's resting on his laurels. You know, I can't have that. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 84. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn <laughs> all about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, knife makers, knife manufacturers, YouTube knife reviewers, anyone who loves knives. That's what we're all about here on that's the Knife right. Junkie Podcast and our Sunday weekend show is the interview show, Bob, a knife maker we're going to hear from today. Yeah, Matt Martin of Vehement Knives. Uh, he's a guy who came onto my radar screen through Bark River Knives. You know, I love those knives and I love Mike Stewart's videos and the Bark River shop tour videos. And uh, then he started popping up in them here and there because he collaborated on a number of knives with uh, Bark River Knives. And uh, I loved the work they were doing the first one that i saw from matt martin was the mac v sog knife a classic combat bowie knife and um anyway he he makes a lot of really beautifully interpreted uh modern versions of classic combat knives and uh, i had to talk to him and you did <laughs> <laughs> yeah we yeah at length we're gonna hear that interview in just a second but first uh need to ask you a favor if you're listening We'd like for you to do us a favor, and if you're liking the podcast, tell somebody about it. Could be by carrier pigeon, word of mouth. Smoke signals. That's right. A Facebook <laughs> post, a tweet, Instagram message, whatever. Just tell one person this week about the Knife Junkie podcast. Selfishly, we want to get more listeners. That's what it's all about. So if you find enjoyment... We would appreciate it if you would tell someone that you think would find enjoyment in it. That way we can help spread the word about the Knife Junkie podcast. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. I'm here with Matt Martin of Vehement Knives of Michigan. He is a fixed blade combat knives specialist, I would say. He makes some of the most beautiful combat-inspired knives uh, out there today. Matt, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's great to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a big honor to be on this with you guys. You came onto my um, radar, I'd say, two or three years back, uh, watching one of the Mike Stewart videos, you know, what's new from Bark River. And uh, I had heard of you guys before, but but uh, kind of seeing it in that video kind of mainstreamed you for me. It was a combat knife. It was the Mac V Sog. And you got to tell me, where where did your love for combat knives come from? Well, I mean, we can put a finer point on it even still with just the Mac VSOG profile. I mean, that is, it, there are lines, uh, I can't remember his rank. I want to say he was a major baker, the original designer of the Mac VSOG back in the 60s. But there are lines on that knife that are unparalleled, I think, in the rest of the combat knife world. There's a lot of style put into something at a time when people were focused on K-Bar, Navy Mark IIs, uh, even Randall Model 1s, and then this thing just comes out of left field, and it's got this menacing profile. It, it has curb appeal that hadn't been seen yet. So as a kid coming up in the knife world, surrounded by SOG specialty knives that I couldn't afford, you'd see them in the mall in the glass case, that was what I wanted to achieve. Um, when I started filing away steel and trying to replicate this very complex shape. So going back to, we had a joke off air about Moby Dick, that was my white whale. How do I capture the lines of the Mac V song profile? And to this day, I still haven't put a harpoon in that bastard's back. <laughs> so, so it was the Mac V SOG in particular that kind of launched you on your, on your knife making, uh, I'm not going to call it a journey, your life in knife making. It's a journey, but yeah, it is also the life. And yeah, 100%. I would say 100% that was the knife uh, that, that jumped out at me that I always wanted to be able to capture. 
that level of style. Not necessarily replicate that knife as I matured as a maker, but that level of style. Well, I, I uh, fell in love with the Mac V-Sog early in life as well. Uh, I saw it in two movies in particular. Uh, the first one was uh, a movie called Uncommon Valor, where uh, you know a group of misfits get back, uh, go back to Vietnam to rescue their buddies, like a mid '80s movie with Randall Tex Cobb. He's got a Mark II hand grenade around his neck. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and there's a there's a scene where. They're, they're prepping for their mission and they're all kind of showing one guy's, uh, uh, you know, showing off his, uh, his hand to hand skills. One guy's showing his explosive skills. This other guy's showing people how to, how to take out a sentry. And he creeps up on one of his buddies and he pulls out the, the, the SOG six inch, you know, Mac V SOG, uh, of that knife and, um, you know, stick it in the back of the head and scramble the brain. I remember that was a, uh, shocking for a 12 year old to hear however old I was. And then I saw it in Terminator 2 when she jams it in the table. I'm like, what is that spectacular knife with those peaks? It's the peaks on the back. It is. And they're uh, I'm bordering on superfluous to the design. It, it doesn't help it perform any function, but boy, does it just give that knife a look. Like you said, it's memorable in Uncommon Valor. It's memorable in T2. And, and there it is. There's that knife at large. So I am going to uh, go out on a limb here and say that the uh, the swale and the two peaks actually do have uh, or could have. I don't know if they had a purpose in the original um, design of it, but they can be used in reverse grip for trapping. If you're if you're doing something where you're kind of grabbing someone else's arm to immobilize them and you trap it between your arm and the back of the blade, those those swells up, if you will, help retain uh, that arm. <laughs> I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Sometimes I wonder, and I know there's a term that I'm forgetting, but where we put purpose after the fact. Uh -huh. uh, I, yes. When I was doing knife combat combative training uh, under the Hodong Go Academy, uh, that was something that we focused a lot on. Obviously, the warrior knife, the Almar warrior knife, yes. comes from the same school of knife combatives. And it's a lot of inverted grip, basing a lot of trapping and stuff in the techniques. So I agree with that. It's something that I subscribed uh, parenthetically with the D on the end, putting it in past tense. Right. But I, I, I don't know if that was the initial intent. I think it's just something we as knife guys picked up on and gravitated towards after the fact. It's like uh, like the military, they, they have backronyms, like Patriot Missile. I will bet you it was named Patriot Missile before they figured out what those letters stood for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, you started filing away, literally. started. Uh, uh, you were inspired by the Mac V SOG. And uh, uh, explain what happened after that and how you came to now be a, uh, a knife maker of acclaim. I, I can't speak to that part. I think it's dumb luck and obstinance, you know, some amount of stubbornness just to not give up when you're making garbage knife shaped objects and then be like, no, this is this is getting cooler. You just haven't seen how bad it was when I started. And so I think that's really uh, how that goes. But as far as everything else went, I ordered one book. I ordered uh, How to Make Knives with Bob Loveless and uh, Richard Barney, you know, Buster Wierenski's in there and everything, too. This was the book. It was a, a tome. It was something important to me. And, and that's kind of where it all kicked off. I realized it was so much more to the knife world than what was at my local mall in those five glass cases. Mm -hmm. and that's when the veil came off and the rabbit hole opened up. Okay, so I look at all of your knives now, and they, I see daggers, and I see drop point uh, kind of pilot-looking knives, and uh, I saw a recurved Tanto uh, a while back. What is what is the underlying theme of all these knives? It's a pretty complex question without it being... We really specialize in what we call field knives. Um, but if you look into our back catalog, you're going to see some things a little bit more outrageous. Or, to be honest, if you see a picture of a knife that I made on any given day where I was like, hey, I'm possessed by Rod Chappelle, and I, I just want this big, sexy, but nasty recurve for no other reason than I want the challenge of grinding it and finishing it and making it pop. I'll be completely frank right here. I'm, I'm really not one of these like, hey, mall ninja, everybody is a stabbing target. That's not really <laughs> who I am. Uh, and nor do I feel like I'm a constant target where I need to defend myself uh, with a bladed instrument all the time. In fact, my number one defense blade is a paramilitary two that I keep in my pocket. <laughs> it's also my number one Amazon box opening blade and my number one apple peeling blade. So when it comes to our patterns, they're fun. And there's something about a knife that is A, a tool, but B, when you get into the higher end, it's just fun. 
and it just appeals to people's aesthetic. They see it and they go, man, that knife gives me a feeling. That knife reminds me of watching Uncommon Valor with my dad on Saturday <laughs> morning sitting on brown carpet, and they want to relive that experience through something tangible. And I think that's the, the service, if you want to call it, that knife makers provide. In particular, I think uh, I just sort of realized as you were talking, your knives do something, uh, do a great service to these classic um, design cues from old military and field knives, but they upgrade them in not just in materials and in attention to detail because they're handmade, but also in design. You know, you are tweaking. Uh, you are not just taking old patterns and and just making them in new materials. You are changing the designs too. Uh, the daggers are really uh, something else in that in that sense. So, I mean, to me, you're you're taking these classic knives and you're classing them up a bit. You know, I have this old K bar that I love, but you know, I, I scrutinize it, and there are things that are lots of things that are off. You know, it was machine made for for service quick, and uh, and so that's what happens. But you're taking these things and classing them up a bit. That's yeah, like uh, Sir Isaac Newton you know, just standing on the shoulders of giants. And so it's easy to pick the ball up where it wasn't even fumble. It was just resting in the end zone for decades. And I walk by and I pick it up and I'm able to walk it back to the opposite end zone. So it, it, that's a very easy thing. And it's just little baby exercises we go through. Like, how can we make this more contemporary, more appealing to today's market, but still have that, that attachment, that nostalgic attachment that our customers are looking for? So how does your shop work? Is it uh, how many people do you have helping you up? <laughs> <laughs> I my wife does all the leather work. Um, I've actually been oh, doing nice. leather work longer than I've been doing knife work, but at some point knives took uh, priority, and I didn't want to do it anymore. So she does. Uh, she has her own company, Skin Bender Leather Works, and uh, she does all of our shoes as well as uh, I mean five six days a week custom work for other customers also. And then we have one shop hand, uh, Jaden. We've been through a few. I would say that we hit the biggest home run with this guy, and uh, he's he's kind of like the cricket in Times Square. I can show him something once, and, <laughs> and he can repeat the process. The only places that I'm not very eager to give up the reins are going to be in the actual bevel grinding um, and and the the kind of rudimentary handle shaping. He can finish the map that I lay out in the handle shape, but neither one of us wants him to do the rough shaping as of now. Okay. Okay. So then take, take me through, take me through the birth of a knife as a design through, uh, you know, so it hasn't even been designed yet through production. The entire thing could be summed up in one word and that word is obsession. So uh, it could be a movie. It could be a book. It could be anything. I tell you, I, I read, uh, Churchill's secret warriors and that's, uh, by Daniel Lewis. And in that, they talk about the beginning of the OSS, basically, as we know it now, as a special boat service when it started, and uh, or as the SOE for Britain, OSS in America, but uh, the special boat service. And Anders Lassen carried a Fairbairn Sykes. Well, that knife got so burned into my head, even though I appreciated the knife previously, that I had to go to the shop and make it. So in that, now we begin the process. Now we begin the design process. So that's Hours of sketching, I'm handier with an eraser than I am a pencil when it comes to making the designs. Uh, and and then we start off on a basic custom knife. We'd start with a bar of steel. Uh, I prefer precision ground, so I don't have to screw with it. And uh, trace that pattern onto the knife. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Back up. You said I prefer precision ground because I don't like to screw with it. What does that mean? As a non-knife maker, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, when you receive material from the mill, it's going to have a mill skin on it. And that mill skin, some cats leave on, which I think is inappropriate, uh, speaking euphemistically. But uh, <laughs> but some people, like myself, like to have that bright steel revealed, and it has to be surface ground to a specific dimension. And that means that my, my steel is completely flat by the time I receive it, or uh. by the time we go to make it into a knife, it's precision ground to thickness. And, and that's what I, I do. You know that so that that's the first step is either I have a surface grinder, we have a surface grind house, or I can order the steel ground from the mill. Got you. If that makes sense. If I'm not yes, it taking does. too far of a journey, and then from there it's just. Uh, I mean, this is where it gets into work. I think all knife makers do the same shit. I, I don't know if we swear on here, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. But you draw the knife on the bar of steel, you blank it out with a grinder, and and then you 
you turn it into something that's going to outlast you, me, or anybody we've ever talked to. So from knife to knife, each one is handmade soup to nuts. So even though you're you might be replicating the same design, say your version of the of Fairbairn Sykes or or uh, the Mac V Sog, each one is going to be a little bit unique because it's been cut out from a blank uh, from the start. Is that is that what you're saying? You can ask my mom or my wife. I'm <laughs> an inherently flawed individual, so yes, every knife is going to be different from one to the other because I'm not a machine. And uh, even on our mid-tech knives, I still hand grind those, but we get them water jet. We have the components okay. rough machined. But even those are going to have variances from knife to knife. I might be hung over that day. Sure. Like, like, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll make it right to itself. But I, honestly, I, I've never hung my hat on consistency just because it's like a fingerprint. People should be able to pick up their knife blindfolded and know that it's their knife because they've grown familiar to that handle shape or that balance point. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was spoken like a true artist. Make it right to itself. Yes, like internal logic of a movie. It's uh, you know, it's a lunkhead who sits there and says, "This isn't real. This is so unrealistic." It's like, well, either the movie maker hasn't done his job and there's no internal logic, or you're a lunkhead. And so what you're saying is, uh, you are not a machine. You're not trying to replicate each time. You're going for the best example in that steel of that knife at that time. Hundred percent. Yeah. So when you decide, or when you come up with a new knife, uh, a new knife design, uh, for instance, the runt was a big one. Uh, is that's is the runt a? Um... There's a G in front of that R. Oh, grunt. Ha. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you should see the look on your face. It was like, it was such an epiphany. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote I wrote it down as runt because it's little. It is. It is. Hi. How do you like them apples? Grunt. I'm gonna I'm gonna write this down. Um, so with the grunt, was that a mid tech? Cause that, that is one that I've seen get, um, a wider distribution. Um, it started as a custom as they do and mm -hmm. it became a mid tech. And to be honest, it's one of our earliest designs. In my <laughs> opinion, it's a pretty immature design. I'm surprised that it got the traction that it got. And we are going to be reintroducing a new version uh, with, you know, kind of this year's design eye, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to soup it up a little bit, in my opinion. And uh, but yeah, it's a it's a mid tech now, and I do believe uh, mid tech it will stay because people seem to really enjoy that model. It, but the fun part is, is even on a mid tech, it doesn't mean that you can't take the extra collective hour mm -hmm. to give it that custom finish. And yep. I think that's what people appreciate at that price point. Do you think that if one of your other designs took off, like say the Grunt did? But uh, that knife was, say, a larger, more complex affair. Would you be um, more likely to want to see that just be a mid-tech thing? And uh, and then you save for the lower numbers. You do all that stuff yourself. You know, at this stage in, in my career, uh, what I want to do, and this is going to get in the weeds a little bit as I have a tendency to do, but... Uh, at, at this stage in my career, I would like to wake up, have a cup of coffee, design a knife, prototype that knife, maybe make a small run of not exceeding 50 of them, and then move it into mid-tech. And, and that way, we have that bread and butter coming in all the time. And that affords me the opportunity, this is going to sound very San Franciscan, but to, to be creative. You know what I mean? And to kind of <laughs> just do that thing that I like to do, those 16-hour yeah. those knives. I don't get the money out of it. I'm not comfortable getting the money out of it. But if I can dope that that process in where we can mid-tech it, all of a sudden now it's a product that people are happy with, but the passion is already on to the next model or the next design. I see your – yeah, the, yeah. Uh, you do not want to lose the fire in your belly because you keep getting orders for something. I got to gotta, gotta keep making more of this damn knife. I'm so sick of this knife, but I keep getting these orders. Yes, that seems like uh, – well, that seems like the way to, to remain fresh, right? You you gauge the popularity of a custom. If it seems like a reasonable risk, you have a mid-tech made of that, and you move on and, and see what, what might catch on next, too. 100%. And ultimately, my goal is to have a small but mighty A-team of uh, mid-tech makers mm -hmm. where I can go in and put out fires, answer questions, maybe perform the more difficult tasks on the build or the more complicated tasks on the build. And otherwise, it's fairly autonomous, and these guys are making knives in the vehement building under the vehement brand to the vehement standards 
and it, at the same time, I'm at the drafting table or I'm on my own grinder making the next run, making sure that these guys have job security ahead of them too. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, how did you meet Mike Stewart? He kind of seems to have mastered that process uh, over and over again, actually. He seems like a great sort of mentor. You know, we wouldn't even be in Michigan if it wasn't for Mike and the rest of the Stewart family. He reached out to me one day unsolicited on one of the bazillion, you know, uh, knife groups on Facebook. And he said, hey, why don't you come out here and kind of see how we do things? And uh, he introduced me to our complete distributor network. We were in with Blue Ridge Knives because of Mike. We I became very close friends with Derek Bone of Knife Ship Free, who's now passed mm-hmm. away. Yeah. Um, so very unfortunately, Derek was actually, when we moved up here, him and his wife, Wendy, uh, brought Chinese food dinner to our house on the first night oh, that we man. stayed. So, I mean, uh, and then, of course, Jason down at DLT Trading. And through that process, I mean, Mike just contacted me on Facebook. And then here we are. Uh, there's a lot of yada, yada, yada between those two margins, but it was unreal. And he, he shed a lot of light on it. I learned a lot of design cues for him from him because Mike is a historian first and foremost. That's So I would say that I met Mike at the perfect time in my career. If I met him too early, I wouldn't have cut my teeth and I'd be strictly on his coattails. And mm-hmm. if I met him too late, I'd be too much like him to ever listen to him. And so, <laughs> that's, wow. yeah, it was it was just a perfect storm, and we're very grateful to them. Perfect timing. He's a, he's a he just seems like such a cool character. You know, I watch his videos, and and I watch uh, I watch the videos from around the shop. It just seems like a a really cool outfit, large and small, kind of at the same time. You know, it has that feeling even when you're inside the walls. You're like, this is a hell of an operation. And then it's also, you're answering every message on Facebook all day. Right. You know what I mean? So it is very large and small. Well put. So he, um, uh, uh, Mike Stewart, was the guy who started Blackjack Cutlery. Is that right? And then, yes. And then they sold it. It, it got sold. And, and, uh, but I managed to score a Blackjack uh, Model 1-7, I think it is. It's yeah. kind of like their Randall. It's the only Blackjack I have, buddy. Yeah, made from with, <laughs> yeah. with the uh, with the uh, yellow micarta handle. You know that. Oh God, man, that is a man. I love that knife, and it's so Bark River. It's uh, nice and convex ground. So when you collaborated with them on the Mac V Sock, was that your first collaboration with them? Yes, I believe so. Yep. So on that, I remember uh, I was curious. I was like, hmm, will this have a convex grind? And and. It did, and it's not surprising because uh, Bark River Knives does an amazing convex grind, so incredibly sharp but also robust at the same time. But what kind of design changes did you have to take your work through, or do you have to take your work through when you do collaborations? How do I put this without sound like a pompous asshole? Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to swing for it. I there there isn't much outside of what makes vehement knives vehement knives what makes our knives what in my opinion and the feedback that i've gotten from our customers and supporters and everything um is in the details right so on our choils they're going to be fully radius they're going to be mirror polished there's going to be this this lock to your hand when you hold certain things so what we do is we give bark river the design i spend I don't know, four, six, ten hours with their engineers to put it into CAD. I help them, you know, develop the design process, but I don't short anything or have to alter anything when it comes to design. It's how far Bark River takes within, you know, a reasonable ability to turn a profit to finish the knife. And if they don't spend the extra three hours per knife, that's their prerogative, you know, but we don't, we don't dumb it down for them in any means. They're very capable, but it, it's in those little nuances that you'll see the difference between a Bark River Mac V-Sog and a Vehement Knives Mac V-Sog. So it's just the time spent on the, yeah, every individual knife. Got you, got you. Because, yeah, I mean, it's a more intimate process uh, in your shop uh, at the moment. Totally. You know? So I don't know if this is, uh, you know, something that most fixed blade makers encounter, but I'm sure this is a question you hear all the time. What about folders? And And when I ask you that, I'm not just saying... Oh, you're a knife maker. You have to make folders to be relevant. 
what I'm because there are people who actually feel that way, by the way. Um, but what I'm actually saying is there are some knives now. Les George has made a few, and and these are knives that are folders, but are evocative of knives from a different era, with all of the uh, updated kind of style cues. Um, uh, Rick Hinderer does it with his XM18s in the in the Parkerizing and and the and the walnut uh, stock he he uses. Um, it seems like fertile ground. That's what I'm getting at, especially with a uh, sort of resurgence in the last five to seven years of people's love for traditional knives, you know, be that uh, hunting knives or um, or slip joints, that kind of thing. How would you see a vehement folder? What what would that universe, what would it look like? Clip point, lock back. That's what it, that's what tell, it would Tell me like. how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's what it would look like. Um, cool. I've got a ton of sketches. It's a little raced up, but you know, carrying the same paradigm that we have with the fixed blades, it has to have that nostalgia to it. It's <laughs> not it's not a buck one ten folder, it's a vehement knife that makes you feel like you're holding a buck one ten folder without any of the inconveniences that come with a buck one ten folder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so that's that that's really where we're at. And the only reason we haven't touched on it, I mean I have the designs drawn. Um I've even tried to get them mid teched with uh, let's say machine shops that deal with knife companies are unreliable at best, right? Um, uh-huh. Until you find that sweetheart and then you never let them out of your sight. <laughs> but as it sits right now, I'm still on Tinder. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, honestly, we have this albatross hanging around our neck, which is the queue. We have a backlog. We haven't accepted orders in earnest since 2016. And I'm very proud to announce that we are within 30 knives well i'm sorry closer to 40 about 39 38 knives but we're in the 30s mm-hmm. uh from exhausting that queue that we've been carrying for years uh wow. and so it's it's like once that's done and we start making knives again you know newer models and i get that breathing room i get that living space then i will circle back to folders but as it sits right now i mean holy hell a humble brag if you will <laughs> we just we just dropped 125 knives on DLT DLTtrading dot com and they sold sold out in less than 10 minutes. What? Yeah, that's I mean, so I don't need to make folders. <laughs> Dude, that's that's funny because you you just said that and I'm like, ooh, I, I started writing down DLT. Go check out. D- <laughs> yeah, right. They sold out in 10 minutes. Well, I'll tell you what, man. You snooze, you lose. That's that's pretty awesome, man. Congratulations. That's like you know having a record and and. And touring and having it sell out. I mean, you know, on a Bob, different scale. It is. It totally is. I mean, look, if you saw Bob Loveless in line at the grocery store at any given moment, he'd be an old man in a funny hat. So let's not shit ourselves and think that we're anything more than what we actually are. We're not important to society. We're not celebrities. But you get that moment of feeling like a rock star yeah. when your shit flies off the shelves. And and that is just a – it's a good feeling. And it it is – what I would say is it's not anywhere near relaxing. I feel mm. like now we have to live up to the hype. Yes, so it's like every yes. night has to be better than the last. Otherwise, people will be like, oh, he's resting on his laurels. You know, <laughs> I can't have that. Yeah, well, it's a judge now. This experience is a judge judging you. Uh, you know, how how are you going to come out with this next batch? How good is it going to be? It better be as good or better than the last. So, yeah, your success is is looming over you, judging you. But you know what? You know, you need the good thing to strive for. You need the scary thing to run from. So what model was that that sold in 10 minutes? Was that the runt? Was that grunt? Grunt, God. yeah. He's got a speech impediment, folks. He can't <laughs> pronounce G's in the front of the words. Uh, <laughs> no, it, I thought it was silent. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, it's Scandinavian, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it was a tunnel rat. So we, uh, we've we had oh, multiple yeah. successful drops with the tunnel rat, uh, sub 10 minute on every drop that we've done, uh, sell through. Uh, grunts uh, perform equally as well, although it's been so long since I've delivered a batch of grunts that I have no idea, you know, where it's at right now. Right, the, the tunnel rat, though. Describe that knife. Um, it's a, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll I'll give you the history on that knife. I went to we used to attend every single Bark River grind, and even we lived in Colorado. And uh, I came up and I fell in love with the Blackjack Model Fifteen Jet Pilot or Airman mm-hmm. or some of that effect. And I found a blank. And Mike knows that I'm a scavenger. And he, he almost has to <laughs> check my pockets when I go to the shop. <laughs> nice. But but I walked into Mike's office and I said, hey, I found a 1516 you know, jet pilot knife. 
I'm going to take this blank and go make it into something else. Um, I just liked kind of the, the silhouette of cast. And so I took that knife and I reground it and I changed the guard and I changed the handle and, and I brought it back to Mike and he goes, Oh, this is awesome. And he's like, that was a terrible selling knife for us. That's going to be a home run for you with these changes. Oh, wow. And, uh, so at that point he got the blessing from the current owner of the blackjack label. Uh, even though Mike still makes all the knives, there's a brand, you know, that owns the, that is owned by another party. And he right. said, Hey, can Matt use the water jet profile for this? to make his own knife and uh you know the gentleman said oh 100 no problem uh and, and that was kind of how it was born so again even more contemporarily i saw a classic knife and i grabbed it and i altered it to make it our own and and then it became what it is i i love how you altered the blade and and i think it might be knowing what the name is but it definitely looks like the kind of blade you put in your teeth you know while you're while you're gearing up to do whatever you're doing Bob, that's the feeling we sell more than anything else. It's that feeling. That's our target is to yes. give you that, put you in that that place so that when you're car camping, you're like, yeah, but I have this. I got this, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, the uh, Tunnel Rat, there's one, it's got sort of a commando style handle, like that kind of Coke bottle yeah. And I, I'm assuming it's like oval in cross section, but it's got that that Coke bottle handle. But I, I, I've also seen pictures. I'm actually looking at one right now with a sort of uh, that sort of horse hoof Bowie shape. I don't know exactly like how the you Moran like Bill Moran. Yes, style yes, 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 yep. exactly. Yep. That is handsome. Thank I you. mean that that. So when you make a knife like that, so it's got a single pin in the middle of the handle. Is that uh, is that a totally different blade going into that? Or, or are you just altering the tang to, to to fit that kind of a handle? When it comes down to the brands, uh, basically all I do is cut off the threaded section mm. and then seat it in there. Uh, we had a uh, customer, I wish I could share this right now, but we had a customer who was a uh, x-ray tech. He actually, he x-rays all his knives to kind of see oh. what's going on behind <laughs> cool. the scenes. And uh, he was really surprised at how much tang is actually in that knife and how fitted it is to the channel. But that's that's all we do. We just cut off the threads and then sink it in there and then hand lap the face of the the handle block until it, it matches up with the hole and everything oh, fits yeah. you know, airtight. Man. Well, I'm not trying to get your uh, industry secrets here, but just, I don't know, just a, a, a beauty. And then I've seen the one, um, what is it? Uh, it's one of your models that has a gigantic fuller. It It, it, it almost comes to the cutting edge. Uh, does that ring a bell or was that a one-off? It might have been a one-off. You might be thinking of the Jet Pilot knife that we rebooted. Was it like a black wash finish? Or? Yes, I believe it was. And yep. it had that sort of the stacked leather and all that. Yep, that's the uh, that was a, a one-off that we were just playing around with, uh, hearkening back to the uh, 1957 Marbles Jet Pilot survival knife, which was mm. then, uh, believe it or not, underbid by Camillus by seven cents a unit. And uh, Camillus... Uh, in Ontario, ended up winning the contract uh, in perpetuity. So the designer of the knife never got the government contract. And the Jet Pilot knives that you see today by Ontario Camillus, uh, those were designed right here in Gladstone in the 50s, and the contract really? was sniped. So after I had <laughs> learned that, I became obsessed with that blade, and I said, I have to make a Jet Pilot survival knife, you know, just to bring it back home. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it, at that point, it's a moral imperative, or somehow the universe steered you that way. Right. Yeah, uh, it's a little woo, but it's. I think it's probably true. What is your? What is the hardest part of of this whole enterprise? Um, what's the hardest part of running a knife company? I mean, you're in a small, you know, American business. What's What's the hard part? The hardest part. The hardest part is uh, making decisions that cause me to move away from my dearest friends and even further from my family. Uh, mm -hmm. In the name of being able to push this business a little bit farther, uh, the second hardest part is taking my entire life out of my garage, out of my lair where all my friends used to ride their bikes up and we drink beer and listen to rock and roll. And it was more of a hangout spot. And now it's a business. Yeah, I would say the, the hardest part is maturing and making personal sacrifices to further the business and it's cost me um, a tremendous amount of what I held dear back home. That's the hardest part. Wow. Well, you know, you can't have anything really 
valuable without that kind of sacrifice. I mean, if you're building something and you're building something meaningful, those sacrifices will repay you. And it looks like they already have. I mean, the work you're you're producing and um, and it seems like meeting Mike Stewart and moving to Michigan has really put everything in kind of ultra mode for you. And uh, I... I <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you made the right decision, but I got to say you're making some fantastic knives. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, meeting Mike was an octane booster for sure. Uh, but the reality is, is if I just rode bikes with my buddies and got drunk in the garage for the rest of my life, yeah, we turn out a decent knife here and again. Mm. Uh, but all I would leave my daughter is a motorcycle and empty beer cans. So yeah. you know what I mean? This yeah. is we have to do something um, for the next generation, and the only way I can see to do that is to build a brand that is marketable long after, uh, you know, my ass is in the dirt. So do you like the knife industry, the knife world in general? Is it a good place to, to, to operate? You know, I'm not a people person per se anyway. So I, I have a lot of good friends in the industry. Uh, I think there's a lot of assholes in the industry. So, I mean, it's, it's a microcosm of society, I would say. Right. Yeah. But overall, I've, I've got to meet some people that are my absolute heroes and sit outside in the pit of blade show and, and knock back a jug of moonshine with these guys <laughs> while other people are lined up to talk to them. And I go, man, I, I've got it pretty good. Not everybody gets to meet their heroes. Not everybody gets to uh, absorb the energy that these legends kind of put out, not mm-hmm. to put, you know, too much esotericness onto it. But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I, I do like it. I, it's my life. I mean, I can't, I can't, it's I'm inextricably tied to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't help but feel that when you're around masters of whatever the craft is, you know? And uh, yeah, you, you they say it's dangerous to meet your heroes because you might be disappointed. Um, I've, uh, through this podcast, met a lot of people like yourself who are my knife heroes, you know, like people who are doing things that, you know, you see and you're like, God, I wish I made that. <laughs> as, <laughs> as someone who makes things, you know, look at that, like, God, wow. You know, and to me, that's the ultimate uh, compliment. Um, so it, you know, it is always a pleasure to meet people who, who are, you know, far along and have, you know, have made a go of, of the knife world uh, or, or of making knives and selling them. And, and well, anyway, you get my idea. You, you know what? I don't mean to cut you off, Bob, but no. what is amazing to me is the guys who started at the same time who were my friends from the early days when we would call each other and be like, I can't do this anymore. Watching them grow into legends now is an amazing feeling. I, I, Brian Efros, I don't know mm. if you're familiar with this yes, work, I am. Efros Knives. Brian and I met at a uh, Usual Suspects Network gathering many years ago, and we hit it off immediately. And we've been friends ever since. And I can tell you many phone calls of him calling me and me calling him saying, I can't do this anymore, or mm. us telling Fishdale's house business, oh, we're killing it. Oh, we're selling mm. hand <laughs> over fist. And it's all BS, you know? And, and then now, I, you know, I, I just talked to him yesterday. And he just had a new baby. Um, so congratulations to the Afros family. <laughs> and uh, seeing the uh, accomplishments and the milestones that he's reached and seeing where his clientele is and seeing where his knives are, there is nothing that you can can that would give me the same rush as seeing these people grow into next generation's legends. And that's amazing. We could be, I could be talking about my buddy like he's the next Tom Mayo. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's unreal. Yes. It's a fantastic feeling. Yeah, especially, you know, Brian Efros has been on my radar a lot recently. Uh, I've been following him on Instagram for about a year. And man, yeah, I reached out to him to, to come onto the podcast too. At some point, I'd love to speak with him making some beautiful stuff, but that's great that you are seeing your contemporaries, uh, rise as you rise. And what do you see in 10 years for Vehement or what do you see for the future of Vehement? I know we're going to be here. But I couldn't tell you what tangent my obsession goes on after next month. You know what I mean? I may be yeah. like, you know what? We can only do slip joints from now on. Who knows? And that's part of my manic mind. So I, I have no clue. I just know that, like right now, I'm in the middle of a bunch of loveless knives, uh, which I, I enjoy making, but I don't enjoy selling. Those are the little uh, double-edged ones. Well, we've got – we're doing drop hunters and shoot knives and okay. we're kind of dancing around Bob's catalog right now. Oh, okay. But I'm doing it for fun. Uh, a lot of them are people who contact me. They're like, oh, this customer of yours really likes your knives. 
uh, here's my budget. Uh, will you make him something? They don't know. They're none the wiser. And I go, mm-hmm. well, this guy would probably really appreciate a drop hunter or a shoot knife or something like that. And then I'm not having to sell and market it because I feel kind of skeezy that way. Like mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. difference between standing on the shoulders of giants and then standing behind them with knockoffs. So it, it, it's – I, I'm not comfortable with it, but I like making them because it extends my ability. It makes my toolbox a little sure. deeper. I get what you mean. I get what you mean by saying you're you're you like making them. You don't like selling them. Yeah, it's because it's not exactly your design. But right. But uh, yeah, yeah. There are a couple of people. Well, there's one shop in particular that makes outstandingly beautiful other people's knives <laughs> that I that I follow on Instagram, and I've I've often thought like hmm, I go to the website and I'm like well that's just about as much as the real thing so I think I'll just hold out for the real thing the guy that you're probably talking about I've uh-huh. called numerous times and I'll be like uh, I won't say his name uh, just because it's not in the most favorable light that, you, that we've painted so far but he's a hell mm-hmm. of a guy the guy is an amazing knife maker and mm-hmm. I've had to call him and say why isn't this mirror polishing what am I doing wrong <laughs> what, how do I get this right and he's very forthcoming with his information and he does specialize in loveless knives and I would say hands down you know I will say it uh, and just in case we're not talking about the same person uh-huh. but Zach Buchanan can no we're not oh we're not <laughs> okay. oh okay no okay Zach can make a loveless knife better than Bob ever could. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> he's oh, wow. amazing at it. He's wow. just a phenomenal maker and a great guy, but he's one whose catalog is not limited, but specializes in the Loveless catalog. But he does such a fantastic job, and you will pay Loveless prices for his nuts. But in, in a way, uh, the Loveless catalog is kind of like the Great American Songbook. It's a, it's, it's a bunch of great tunes that everyone from Billie Holiday to Frank Sinatra to whomever – sang and and cover and get to get to put their english on and to me you know there there are certain knife designs that kind of reach that status to me the uh your version of it was the big bear but the uh the loveless fighter the the double-edged sub hill oh my wow, yeah. good lord i mean is that not the coolest knife ever i mean ever with a sub hilt oh my I, god yeah it, i mean and geez, as a maker could... you have to go down that path you have to say well can i do it and it's a it's, to me it's like I, I treat them as rites of passage. Like once mm-hmm. you and then you can go back to your shop and do the things you do, hopefully with a little bit more glow to it, right? Yep, yep. It's also like being a painter and and doing your copies of Degas or wh- whomever, you know, like uh, doing master. You know, okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do a Vermeer today. I'm gonna try and paint Vermeer. Of course, I'll never paint Vermeer, but in trying, you learn so much. It's it's got to be the same thing. The other day, I was I was like thinking about uh, talking with you, and and I was like, how would I sum up his outfit? And and I wrote it on the back of this card. You know, I always have a little card, and I forgot about it until now. But when I asked you where do you see vehement in the future, you said, well, um, you know, it's hard to forecast beyond a month because of your whims. And I remembered I labeled your your uh, vehement knives as a boutique traditional combat knife atelier. <laughs> I mean, is that not right? I guess not to put too fine a point on it, but yeah, I would say. Yeah. I mean, in a way, you're like you're you're like the. <laughs> sorry, you're like Coco Chanel with your with, <laughs> with your assistants, and you'll pump out a couple of really like outrageously awesome things, and then when you want them mass produced, you do it. You you, know, you figure out okay, all right, I'm going to stop with that uh, analogy there, but you, you get my point, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, I, I guess uh, perception is reality. So yeah, I was hoping you'd be like like Mad Max with a drinking problem. Like that, that, that's how I would have summed it up. You know what, man? You know what? Like like it's funny because I see this all the time. You you look at the art and then you look at the artist and. I love to see, you know, you know, I see interviews with you and I see interviews with other knife makers. Um, and there's a lot of character and there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, gravity there and, 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 and rough around the edges. And then you look at the knives and it's like refined, you, you know, um, this kind of is a, re- a reemergent theme for me. Artist and art, you know, are, are 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 different, and the person who creates the thing is not the thing, and vice versa. And it's, um, it's complementary contrast, and, yeah. And that that's we try to impose that even on the works themselves. You know, I would say the earliest example of this is is back, uh, not to just keep you know revisiting Bob Lovelace's shop, but 
red liners on a knife is complementary mm-hmm. contrast. It stands out, right? Uh, so a lot of times, in more of our standard finishes, we like to counter polish one surface versus another, you know, so that they're, the yeah. scratch lines are running perpendicular to each other. Just make things pop a little bit it, on a on a rough tiger lips, you know, apocalyptic looking knife. We'll throw a mirror polished choil in there just <laughs> just to give that little pop, and that is that you know if i was going to be so arrogant to consider myself an artist uh that's where the artist is in the work it, it's you want to put that contrast in there because you I, I recognize that there's a contrast between my works and my personality yes and an element of surprise is absolutely necessary for a uh for a <laughs> for something that approaches art i'm not going to call a knife art because it's got purpose other than yep. Other than being appreciated, you know. Uh, so how do you, how do you get a vehement knife? How, how does one how does one find and actually acquire one? I know there aren't tons of them uh, because they're all handmade. So what's the best way to get in touch with you? What's the best way to get get our hands on your work? That's the sixty four thousand dollar question, and it's <laughs> not by design. It's not by throttling productivity and keeping scarcity and being this kind of vaporware that nobody can get. You have to know the secret handshake. It's just we make them as fast as we can. I mean, up until the time that we went live, I mean, I'm grinding in the shop. The best way to get a vehement knife is going to be get on DLT Trading's uh, mailing list. They, we've we've pared everything way down to have one dealer. It's one mouth to feed. It makes it much easier. Get on their mailing list. Um, otherwise, uh, Facebook, as antiquated as that's getting, is our number one source for real-time updates in our group, the Vehement Syndicate. And if you join the syndicate, we kind of have a program going and, you know, we keep it pretty small. It's only about 2,500 members. We have well over 10,000 on our fan page, but our group, we keep small, we keep it intimate and the syndicate has its privileges. We call it ship. And that's where we announce release dates. That's where Mm. we announce upcoming models. Um, And then we have our own private sale group, GFYFB. Um, would go fork yourself Facebook uh, <laughs> because they uh, they were coming down on knife sales pretty hard and we wanted yeah. to separate all our groups from the sale group. But in there, you'll see a few bought and sold. Secondary prices are astronomical. I, I wouldn't mm. pay as much as people are paying for one of my knives, but that's just what the market does. But yeah, so I would say the best place is, is honestly get in the VM and syndicate on Facebook and that's where you're going to get the most real-time information for release dates and drops and everything. Well, Matt Martin, uh, congratulations for your uh, success thus far on Vehement Knives. I think you're you're killing it, and just uh, I mean, I just drool over the stuff you're putting out. I follow you on on Instagram, and on uh, I, I see what I can get on YouTube, and I love looking at pictures of your work. I think you're doing awesome stuff, and I, I really like the niche that you're filling, and I think you're you're doing it the right way. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Bob, and thanks, Jim, for hiding in the shadows over there and making this all work. <laughs> I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, much success to you guys and your podcast going into the future. Thank you, sir. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. And we're back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 84, show notes about everything uh, Bob and uh, Matt talked about can be found at theknifejunkie.com slash 84, theknifejunkie.com slash 84, as well as links to uh, Matt's Facebook page, along with the vehement syndicate on Facebook, along with the VMA Knives website, and the podcast, Behind the Blade podcast. We'll have links to all that in the show notes. Bob, a good conversation with Matt. Uh, he said you've, you've followed him for a while. Uh, what, what was your takeaway from actually now talking to the man? Well, you know, I, I follow a lot of knife makers who are starting their businesses or have started them and are making a go at it. And uh, definitely Matt Martin is making a great go out of it, at it. But the thing that really struck me is he's got, uh, he speaks like an artist. He's got the soul of an artist. I went to art school, uh, eight years of art school, and I know how art artists speak and he kind of has that soul you know he gets latched onto something that fascinates him and consumes him and he works on something and creates something and then when he's done with it he moves on to something else uh, that consumes him and that just struck me as uh, sort of an artistic temperament so it was great to kind of connect with him on that level mm-hmm. all right 
Well, as we said, everything uh, can be found at theknifejunkie.com slash 84. And when you're on that webpage, if you happen not to be subscribed to the Knife Chunky podcast and you're getting this from a friend, well, you can subscribe in your favorite podcast player, podcast catcher, whatever you like. And you can find the links at theknifejunkie.com slash subscribe. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. I want to thank you for joining us on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.